James DeLacy here from Sweet Science of Fighting. I'm going to bring you something a little different today. We're going to break down some professional fighters training. Today we're going to do Devin Haney. Now, I realize when this actually comes out, the fight will have already happened, but it's still good to break down some of this training so you can get an insight into you know, whether something is good, bad, good to follow, should you replicate something they do, why they're doing it, etc. Obviously, I'm not in any of these camps, so this is an outside view, but... I'll take you through, I'll screen record this, and uh, you can follow along with me. Now, in the future, I will do these so they are done before the fight. I think I should hopefully do, maybe maybe I should do Tony Ferguson training with David Goggins next if there's some footage, but this one is uh, Devin Haney, and this is part of his training here. Yeah, I hope the sound isn't too bad. Okay, I'll put this on mute anyway. There's not much here. So here we have a beach session. Now this was recorded about a week ago. So this is, if this was recorded at that time, this would be about two weeks before the actual fight. Now let's start by breaking down what they might be trying to achieve with a session like this. Now a session like this on the sand, hill sprints, you're probably looking to develop very high intensity conditioning and typically you're looking at more peripheral style adaptations so uh, adaptations to the muscles to be able to resist fatigue buffer metabolites that occur through high intensity activity so you can go harder for longer now there are many ways to do this unfortunately running a hill this long and at that speed, I do not believe will get you what you're after with something like this. The footwork drills in the beginning, let's start there, are relatively useless in my opinion. And that is regardless of the sport. You see this a lot in uh, American football. Obviously you see it here in boxing and they say it's for foot speed. Foot speed is irrelevant in all sports. Regardless of what you've been told and sold on Instagram, foot speed does not mean jack shit. Uh, it's all about being able to anticipate, read your opponent, know the situation, know what tools you have to answer and solve the problem in front of you. And having fast feet does none of that for you. At least not in this context. If you're talking fast feet in the context of boxing, that's different. And this is not going to develop that. If you go and listen to the podcast with Sean Mishka, hopefully I said that one right we dive into a lot of i guess that theory and the, that idea of training in that podcast so the fast speed stuff doesn't really do too much there in terms of the hill sprints themselves two weeks out now we need to bear in mind here as well if you're doing hill sprints on sand is this a novel stimulus one is this something that he's been doing on different surfaces throughout camp is this something he's been doing all camp for example if he was doing this <clears throat> all training camp 12 8 four weeks out etc okay i don't see any issue with continuing doing something like this two weeks out as an example it's not something i would say would be that i think you should do regardless but if he was already doing it and that's what he was set in stone doing cool no problem if this was something they decided to bring in two weeks out from a fight then i think that is not a good idea the fatigue you're going to generate from doing something like training on sand on a novel surface like that is going to carry over big time over the next two or three days as the fighter goes through the rest of camp. Now, the other issue with training on sand is the idea of the work becomes more muscular versus more tenderness or elastic driven. Now, as Boxers, or at least professional boxing is slightly different in terms of the style. Amateur boxing, you're bouncing around a lot. Professional boxing is not as much bouncing. However, there's still that component of having that elastic ability, being able to generate a lot of power through the elastic or various tissues surrounding the muscle. The problem with training in sand is sand as a surface is soft, as you know. So when you're doing things like or trying to run hill sprints or doing some kind of plyometric activity the sand gives way and that sand give way is like a compliant foot or ankle so when we talk about stiffness around the foot and ankle we're talking about the ability to rapidly change from the eccentric hitting the ground 
to the concentric, which is going or muscle contracting. And that rapid eccentric to concentric, known as the stretch shortening cycle, is a demonstration of our ability to use elastic energy. And elastic energy, essentially like you're going to produce force with the muscle and then this elastic energy tops it up and it gives you like an extra boost as it would be an easy way of, uh, I guess, explaining that. So when you're training on sand, you lose, you don't lose the ability, but you don't train that ability. You train the opposite ability. So if you do a lot of sand training, you can reduce your essential, your rebound, your elastic, your power ability, because the sand gives way, making the work more muscular. Now there is a time and place where you can use some sand training. For example, if you are an amateur boxer and you're maybe you have two big fights a year, just as an example, after a big fight, you know, doing like a few weeks of training on the sand, not a big deal. It can make the work more muscular. It can reduce the intensity of the work because of the ground contacts are longer on the ground. So there's no issue there. But as you get closer to a fight, when you're trying to maximize power development, you're trying to maximize the ability to produce force quickly. You're trying to maximize the ability to repeat high intensity power efforts. Training on the sand doesn't really make sense because it doesn't tick any of those boxes. In terms of work capacity, again, we're trying, when we define work capacity, work capacity is not just being able to do work or just do more. It's about, in this context, being able to repeat high intensity efforts. That is your work capacity. And the sand doesn't bring that. Um, <clears throat> I probably should have just played this clip while I was talking the whole time. But either way, you get some ideas of, so like, what is this really achieving? Like, what is, what is the point of doing something like that? And then the sprint up the hill, again, isn't max intensity. It's more of a slow jog. Now, here, yeah, I, I watched this before, and so he, he was basically talking about making it mentally hard and mentally tough. Now, if you're already a pro boxer at the top of your game, you don't need anyone to come try and make you more mentally tough through exercise. And being mental toughness through exercise is a misnomer regardless. There's no such thing as making someone mentally tough through a training session. It doesn't happen. There's a reason, I mean, it's obviously taken from the army most of the time, but there's a reason Navy SEALs go through Hell Week once and it's not to make them tough, it's to weed out the ones that aren't going to make it. This one I quite like. However, again, on sand, you're kind of reducing the efficacy of this exercise, of, of the shuffle. Um, but <clears throat> coming back to the mental toughness side, again, you're not going to make someone mentally tough through exercise. Hell Week is there to weed out the people who are not going to make it as SEALs. And they don't go through that again. The training is more, I guess you could say, athlete orientated around there. Um, second thing with these hill sprints is if you're going to do high intensity or maximal intensity efforts, you want them to be 100% maximal intensity. As in, they should be very fast. And after 10 or so seconds, you should be absolutely so fucked. You don't want to do another one. That's the only way to get the most out of those efforts. And... Because what's on sand, I'm going to give you that, unfortunately. Um, and if you're going to do this, say, for example, sprinting, like running sprinting, I would not advise that either, just because the hamstring, the risk of hamstring injury is so damn high, uh, especially in athletes that don't run for a living, which are boxers in this instance. Now, am I saying that you shouldn't ever run, you shouldn't ever sprint? No, if that's something you've always done, you have a background in, you're used to doing it, go for it. But most fighters have completely dog shit running mechanics and just will end up injuring themselves. Now, see there, they've done some band stuff in there as well. Just to work, work the hips. I, I really like that uh, shuffle up the hill, this exercise here. It's, um, it's a nice one. I just don't, I'm just not on sand. Okay, here we go. Some jumps. That's interesting. So, if we're talking about reasonings why you would do something you would do jumps up a hill okay the reasons we want to do jumps up a hill one we can reduce the landing impacts so typically especially if you've got maybe if you're an old athlete you got some beat up knees especially if you're doing broad jumps and things they can be pretty hard on your knees doing broad jumps up a hill usually fixes that problem because you're landing at a higher surface so you get less impact it's a good thing especially two weeks out from a fight and you can still express power perfect you should do that but judging from those jumps, <clears throat> they're not really maximal. So 
what are they really achieving from doing something like that? Two, uh, that was pretty much it. There was just a shit ton of them. Three, they do them after doing hill sprints, which kind of defeats the purpose of doing the jumps. Unless you're doing the jumps for, say, a work capacity reason, but that should have been done many weeks to months ago. So having those in there, at least after, if this video, they record it and they cut it, and they this is the order they did the exercises in, it doesn't make any sense to have jumps in there after doing sprints and then doing sprints again. So we can continue watching some of this. I think that might be the end of the... Uh, End of the actual hill sprint session. Let's see what they're talking about now. I think they finished on one long one there. So they don't show much strength and conditioning, or at least gym work in here. Uh, and at least in this episode, they show a little bit here. Yep, that's, uh, that's the goal. No injuries, no niggles can't complain then that's basically as a coach you get out of the athlete's way if they're not having any injuries and niggles hey doesn't matter what else you're doing honestly and a lot of these top athletes honestly if you're doing a lot of stuff and they're potentially getting injured or niggled or hurt or all that stuff you're kind of just getting in their way these guys are so talented that they win fights and they're professional athletes not because of the training they do but often often in spite or despite what they do so <clears throat> Here we have a, uh, I guess you could call it a, I like to call it almost like a sled hypo. So being able to use a full body and then use your legs, hips, and then arms. I really like it. It's, it's almost, it's like a medicine ball scoop toss, but heavier with the sled. And you can do it over and over. I really like this exercise. This is a good, a good choice just for general full body power. Plus as a boxer who's always playing with what's in front of them, shoulders, arms in front, hunched over in front this gives a little bit of extension whereas often everything's kind of in that flexion posture so i like that as an exercise choice um these push-ups have a lot to be desired regarding elbow position and then a lot of front raises which is interesting i do like this kettlebell so let's start on some others on on this first one here so push-ups okay i on the medicine ball, cool. Extra range of motion. However, when you're doing push-ups, typically you don't want this this T shape on your push-up. You want it to be like an arrow. So your elbows will be 45 degrees from your torso. You want to be in that position. It's typically safer for your shoulder. You're stronger in that position. And it's a position where you typically push from. You're not ever out in this position. Um, yes, I can see in some instances, for example, throwing a hook and boxing, you can be there. But if we're just talking general push-up, mechanics to be stronger i would have those elbows a little closer and then front raises um i will just say that i would never program front raises for a boxer uh, none of my programs have front raises for any combat athlete in the sweet science of fighting underground but that's solely because you spend so much time in that position so much time with the arms in front of you, plus you're doing things like bench press, push-ups, etc., that you don't need to do more on top of it to add so much more fatigue that isn't going to give you much more out the other end. That's just my opinion and experience with it. Um, doing rows holding a fat grip dumbbell at your face. Oh, it's actually towel rows. Okay, towel rows. Yeah, nice way to train your your hands, wrists, and grip. Obviously, with the fat grip on the dumbbell, does he need to hold that at his face? Eh. I don't think it. Honestly, I don't think it really matters. Uh, but I do like the the towel grip row. That's a that's a nice addition. Um, there, kettlebell. I really like this kettlebell. Um, I don't actually know what you call the exercise. It's just what they're not. I think I call it a 1990 uh, bottoms up kettlebell carry. But typically, when you're doing something like this, you actually want to keep that 90 degree angle on the arm, and you want the elbow to be like right in front. And when you get that right in front, you almost have like that little bit of external rotation and it really nails your uh, your rotator cuff and, and kind of that uh, deeper in the shoulder. So that's a nice exercise to definitely uh, copy, I guess. Here's some more sloppy push-ups, some lateral raises, rope climbs, I like that. 
There's another exercise. Reverse flies, perfect. Um, some kind of ladder thing with the arms going through. Whatever, I guess. Towel pull-ups. I'm a big, big fan of towel pull-ups, especially for grapplers. And I do see the benefits of doing it as a boxer or a striker just for hand and wrist health like to have that grip and to have that the strong hands and wrists so they don't deform when you're throwing punches yeah definitely worth doing um just be wary that if you're doing a lot of boxing or a lot of striking and doing this on top obviously it can take its toll so just bear that in mind that's uh that covers my thoughts and reactions on Devin haney's boxing strength and conditioning training and if you like this please let me know because i'll do more of these this is way easier for me to do than any other content just with our little bubs that's uh always active and things like that so it's hard to pull out a camera all the time but this is relatively easy because i can sit here and do it at night or in the morning but yeah so that's just to recap on this on the sand training and on the strength and conditioning if there's a video you want me to react to or break down let me know too in the comments and i can do that as well but i'll see you in the next video